Uh, beautiful. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, welcome to the presentation today. As I said, we did one yesterday. It was a bit of a snapshot of it. And literally, I run a whole day workshop on uh, uh, one on weight loss and so on, and a whole day workshop on uh, the gut microbiome. And why I'm so excited about the gut microbiome is because over the last half a dozen years, there has been so much research, there's been more research in the last half a dozen years than there has been coming out that is published in the scientific journals than there has been of all of the history of the gut microbiome. So we've gone from here to here in terms of the amount of evidence and information. And as a result, you're here because when I ran my first gut microbiome talk about 10 years ago, five people attended. You know, they were, they were my students. They wanted to come and make me feel good. I run a session now, I run a session here, I run a session in Perth, and every time it's fully booked out. And the reason is because it's also in the media. And people are now aware that the gut microbiome, and I'll describe what this is in a moment, isn't just about the gut anymore. It's about everything from depression and anxiety. It's from how you feel, your moods, right through to your immune system, the autoimmune conditions that you've got, right down to arthritis and psoriasis, right? So virtually every single condition out there is one way or another related to the gut. And uh, how I got interested in it was, was, was first of all via my mother. Um, my mum's passed away a few years ago <clears throat> and um, she was fit and active up until 86. Uh, and, and my mum, when I, when I was young, I was coming home from primary school, I'd come home from primary school and if I had a headache, my mum would say, have you been to the toilet? If I come home and I was tired and run down, she'd say, have you been to the toilet? If I come home and I had a broken arm, she'd say, have you been to the toilet? <laughs> my mum was obsessed with the toilet. Now she didn't necessarily know why, but back in those days, one of the first things you were taught about health and well-being is what are your toileting and toileting habits? How frequently do you go? What does it look like? What does it <clears throat> smell like? <clears throat> you know, we get into these nitty-bitty nitty grits later on. But all of these conditions were questions that were asked regularly. When I went to my GP back in those days, and, and I'm, I'm 60 now, so we're talking 53 years ago or something, my GP would say, and what did it smell like? And what did it look like? And all those other questions out there because they knew it was one of the best indicators. Now, that was recent history. And for the, unfortunately, the last 50 years, we've lost sight of that and we're now coming back to it. We're now actually coming back to it. So I will, I will tell you now, in the next 10 years, your GPs will start be referring you to gut clinics and holistic gut health centers and probiotics and probiotic protocols and all that. They will be changing the way they do it, up slowly, of course, because again, the pharmaceutical model doesn't allow for uh, things like probiotics and, and simple strategies to come into place where there's no money involved. So going back to it, we're, we're, we're changing. It is changing and the awareness, as I said, whenever I run a session in Perth, it fully books out. Now, with that, you also have to go back in history. Throughout history, there is reference to the gut and the micro, well, what we would call the microbiome poo, okay? That was all we could talk because I didn't know about uh, uh, bacteria and, and fungi and anaerobes and viruses back then. But literally throughout history, and if I go back, let's say 20 million years, and here I'm talking about the great apes. The great apes engage in a number of activities that are related to actually healing and fixing up their gut and their gut microbiome. Realistically, what they would do is um, they, they would first of all engage in something called coprof coprophage, which is going and chewing on the poo of other animals. Now, you're probably going gross, aren't you? Yeah. But one, there was a lot of undigested seeds and foods in there. But two, there was also a whole heap of bacteria that they would get every time they went near them. So the, the monkeys you'd be seeing and the chimpanzees and the would have to be following the elephants and the giraffes and all those other animals and getting these probiotic doses every day. It just wasn't in the capsule. Okay? So that's a few million years. It dates back to the Egyptians where they, they did colonics and the, the Egyptians where they did, where they did um, uh, 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 a lot of the herbal remedies and the remedies those days referred to fixing the gut. Then we move on to Hippocrates and you've all heard of Hippocrates, Hippocrates, I don't know where you come from. And, uh, and Hippocrates um, said that all disease begins in the gut. Now he didn't actually mean that, you know, it did the stomach and that. What we interpret it to mean now is the microbiome, the microbiome. Now, throughout, right up until recent, and, and we look at the Maasai tribe, the Maasai tribe in, um, in Africa, one of the few remote countries, uh, sorry, uh, populations, 80% uh, of their 
herbal treatment in someone for wellness, I'm saying to get over an illness or something, for their wellness revolves around fixing something to do with the gut. And they don't know the biochemistry and the reasons, and they don't know about bacteria, but 80% of their herbal remedies. And again, this is all published in the scientific journals. So historically, we are the only culture that doesn't have any culture. We're the only culture who has stopped focusing on our shit. We're the only ones who have stopped worrying about going through because all of a sudden, 50 years ago, well, even probably 70 years ago, post-World War II, we started being pharmaceuticalized. We started going into chemicals, toxic chemicals we could put in a body in the assumption that it gets us well. I want to take one step back. Modern medicine is great, but it treats the symptoms. It doesn't deal with it in terms of chronic illness. We're spending more and more money on pharmaceuticals every single year, and illness is going up every single year. And the only thing that's going to turn this around is information like this and the other seminars you go to and the awareness you have. Now, you can understand then that I'm not liked by some groups out there, but I'll go back to a really basic concept. I'm a scientist. I don't have vested interests. My vested interests are the books that I'm going to sell you at the end of this. Very, very clear and other, a few other bits and pieces. That's how we make our living, converting the evidence into books, into talks, and traveling around the country and doing 100 talks a year. So coming back, your gut microbiome. The first thing, as I said, what is linked with it? Well, here is a short list I compiled in about five seconds from the book that I'm currently writing on the gut microbiome. And all you've got to do is look through there and go, geez, you're joking, Pete. We now know that all these illnesses are related to the gut. Now, please don't assume that if you fix the gut up, all of these illnesses are going to disappear because there are other factors in there. But what we do know, let's say for the case of Parkinson's disease here, there was a study about five years ago, and they were able to calculate that about 50% of Parkinson's disease is caused by gut dysbiosis, an upset gut, a gut that has more of the negative bacteria, and I'll describe these in a moment to you, than the good bacteria. The balance was out of whack, and we call that state dysbiosis. So, we know that 50% of Parkinson's disease is caused by dysbiosis. So the first thing you're going to say is, wow, wow, you saw it on the front page of the paper, didn't you? Did anyone? No. Did anyone know it? Did anyone see it? I know. Yeah. Well, it wasn't in the media. 50% of Parkinson's disease can be prevented, at least in theory, from fixing the gut microbiome. And it wasn't in the media. Think of all the suffering. So that's why I'm asking you to take this message out there, and if a person's got Parkinson's disease, don't go up and say, oh, we can fix you. You can't, you can't. But fixing the gut microbiome will improve their conditions, but even better, if we all engage in this activity now for ourselves and our friends and our neighbors and everyone else around us, we can actually reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease by 50%, as well as multiple sclerosis, arthritis, every form of arthritis. Psoriasis, which is a form, there's over 120 different forms of arthritis. The main one, there was a paper a couple of days ago published on osteoarthritis, published in the, in the scientific journal Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal, or one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. And it said osteoarthritis is not a condition of aging and wearing and tearing. It is a condition caused by inflammation and eating and stress. A quick interpretation. Oh no! Oh no! Do you know what fixes it? Do you know where most of the inflammation comes from? The gut. The gut. So we fix the inflammation, we start to fix osteoarthritis. It's the same with rheumatoid arthritis. We go to any allergies and asthma. All of these conditions can be improved, as I'll show you later on. You know, 20 to 25 percent reduction in the risk of infants developing eczema, which is a, considered a precursor for asthma. If they were given probiotics. Wow. And that was, by the way, that was 10 years ago. Now, there's a hell of a lot more research on that. And that was done by something called the Cochrane Review. And we've got all these conditions here. Diabetes type 2. Diabetes type 2 is now considered the most costly illness in America. And soon, if not already, the costliest illness in Australia. And it's totally reversible. It's totally preventable. And we keep pumping money into it. So diabetes, type two. What's really, really interesting, and I'll repeat this later, just so you make sure, the main treatment for diabetes type two is a drug called metformin. 
every person who's been a diabetic for a while is on metformin. Do you know what metformin is? It fixes the gut bacteria. It's a prebiotic. Oh no! Don't tell anyone in the medical industry this. Don't tell me they're giving something that's called a prebiotic. It stimulates the production of a gut bacteria called Acomensia municifilia in the gut. Please don't worry about the name. It took me a week to remember that one, okay? Acomensia municifilia, so I'll just call it AM probably. And it stimulates this AM bacteria in the gut which regulates the glucose levels, which changes the blood sugar level, which improves the outcome of diabetic type two. Wow, isn't this amazing? And it all comes from the gut. If you inject metformin into the blood, it doesn't work. It has to go via and work with the gut bacteria. Now, I'll tell you some more things about uh, that as we go along, but uh, so depression, the research coming out now, again, you're not likely to solve all depression by improving the gut microbiome, but you're likely to improve the condition of most people who have it, and for some people, they will feel good anxiety. A, I, I, I won't name my son, <coughs> no, I won't, I won't. And uh, uh, he came back with a bit of anxiety, and we said, well, why don't you try the probiotics? Got to the probiotics within a couple of days, he said, I can't believe the difference. A couple of different, and we've said dozens, dozens of people like that who try the probiotics, try get on the probiotic protocol. Then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end. You know what things you can do, and they and they, they come back, and, and some of it's almost some of it's instant within days. Please, however, remember that what I'm talking about here is a journey too. You're not going to fix it. Oh, it's fixed. I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's a lifelong journey. And we've taken generations of poison in, so we're going, to, we're going to fix it. Then we've got eczema and dermatitis, psoriasis, immune system disorders, lactose intolerance, gluten intolerance, and so on. And the list goes on and on and on. If you come up with the name of a disease, I don't even need to know what I say it. So if someone comes into me, and I'm not a medical practitioner, remember, I'm a PhD <laughs> researcher, so I don't, I don't tell people about getting off medication or anything, I just tell them most of it doesn't work. But somebody comes and says, Look, um, Peter, I'm feeling sick, so I say, Fix the gun. Fix the gut. Now you're going to hear me say that 20, at least 20 times today. You're going to say, Pete, what do I do to this? Fix the gut. Um, I want to do this. Fix the gut. You want, if you want to overcome this, fix the gut. Because the first and foremost thing is it's the easiest, the cheapest and most effective way. And it doesn't just work in one area. Oh, I'm going to fix the diabetes type 2. It works in all of these areas. So all of a sudden you go, wow, I'm getting multiple benefits. I'm feeling better about the diabetes type 2. I'm less anxious about it. You get the idea? All of these things come into play. So the, the gut microbiome is the total health perspective. And that's what we're after here, the total health perspective. And that's where I deal with, I, I look at that broad perspective. So there are all the conditions. Now what is the gut microbiome? The micro obviously refers to microorganisms. And when we're talking about microorganisms, most of you will be thinking about bacteria. And when we're talking about probiotics, most of, you, most of you are probably thinking about the lactobacillus and even one called lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. Or some of you may be saying, uh, okay, I know, there's another one called bifidobacteria. Yeah, they're two, they're two. And they're the ones up here called the essential or beneficial flora. They're the good ones. They're the good ones up there that are actually looking after us. Now, there's another one, another group, who are called the opportunistic. Now, I can refer to these as any names. These are the, the baddies, the negatives, the opportunistic. Opportunistic is, is a really good name for them because guess what happens if all of a sudden, and uh, you, you, you go out there, you get rid of all the bacteria in the gut, guess what comes back first? Opportunistic, the opportunistic ones. You're in a garden and your gut is a lot like your garden. So in your garden, you've cleaned out all of the paddock at the back of it. You got rid of everything that was green. You just have to go away on a holiday, you come back a month later, what's there? 90% weeds? 90% weeds, you agree? 10%, oh, look at those, there's a couple of flowers in there or something that have come back. And that's what happens. So these are opportunistic because if there's a gap, if there's a space, if there's an opportunity, they will fill that gap. And so that's the whole trick here. We've got to control this. Now, when it comes to the microbiome, and I'll say this quite a few times, it's not about not having these ones because you're not going to get rid of them. You're not going to get rid of them. What it is, is the balance. You want more of these ones and less of these ones. So more of the goodies, more of the essential, the beneficial flora, and fewer of these. Now probably the one most of you are familiar with is, 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 a, is a fungi, you know, thrush, candida, that one. 
That's probably, uh, probably of greatest concern to most people and why that's of greatest concern is because it loves the Western diet and lifestyle. It loves the sugar, it's a fungi. Now, one, one thing about fungi and bacteria, bacteria are incredibly small, fungi are, about, are incredibly small but a thousand times bigger. And they've got these little tentacles called hyphae that go in and hold on and they're a lot more resilient. So you've got to understand, to get rid of these um, opportunistic uh, fungi, the, 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 um, the candida, it takes a lot of effort. It's not going to happen overnight. So my message is, these are the ones we want to lower down in number, these are the ones we want to grow, and we continue to feed these ones so that these ones are always working in your benefit. And I'll explain which ones these are in a moment. And then we'll get the transitional flora, the, 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 the drifters, the, the OKs. There's, um, there's, you know, the thousands, tens of thousands of these varieties and species of bacteria that'll just pass through without a problem. Some of them may help on the way. Some of the, some of the yogurts you get, some of the um, varieties or, or, or the species in the yogurts you get, uh, they're not really essential or beneficial. But as they pass through, they might just um, annoy this one a bit. So they're just passing through. They're not going to do anything serious. They're not going to do anything great. They'll just pass through. And a lot, well, they'll just pass through anyway because it's not the right environment. And what's critical here for all of these ones is the right environment. It's got to be that perfect environment. It's like anything. If you've got the weeds cleared from your garden, you've got to make sure the sun shines there, the rain comes, the fertilizers on them. You've got to go out there and nurture them and pick some of those weeds away to grow something. The same occurs here. So a change in the environment changes the microbiome. Now, that's apparent because we've got, we've got a microbiome all over us. We've got a skin microbiome. We've got an oral microbiome. We've got a, 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 an esophageal and a digestive. And until recently, we actually thought we had a, a respiratory, upper respiratory biome, but everyone thought it was sterile down there in the lower respiratory parts of the lungs. We now know we've got our lung microbiome. Now have a think about that in terms of chronic respiratory illness and stuff like that. We're going to keep that in balance because that imbalance in the lung, lung microbiome is protecting you from things, the, these other conditions, viruses, uh, pneumonia and other conditions out there, which shows up in the literature by the way. So that's the idea of it, and it all depends on well, one of the major factors in there, one of the major factors in all this is the pH. Now the pH is your acid level. That's the best way to describe it. If it's got a pH of one, it's extremely acid. Your stomach should have a pH of one and two. And we'll go into that. Then it goes down there, and it goes into the six and the seven, and seven, and, and, and changes as it goes through the system. The pH is one of the main regulators and the gut bacteria also regulate the pH. So the good bacteria often make it a little bit more acidic and the bad bacteria less acidic and there's this imbalance that occurs. But we'll go into a little bit of that. So the gut microbiome. We used to estimate that there's about 150 to 300. In those days they used to grab a poo sample and they put it in a culture dish. Has anyone seen those culture dishes that you know they do in the lab? And then you put it in and we used to, we used to do some work with that. Um, we were actually doing some uh, uh, bacteria work and fungi work uh, a couple of decades ago now. And you put it in uh, an incubator and you incubate it and then you see what grows and then you count them. You literally count them under a microscope. And, and that would give you an idea. Now they've got DNA, genetic, gen, gen, a genetic way, um, uh, um, something called uh, uh, metagenomics and stuff where they actually can scan everything for the DNA parts and so on and identify straight away. So the technology is huge. That's why now there is a, a, so much more information coming out because the analytical techniques. And we now know there's at least a, a thousand different microbiome, sorry, microorganisms living in your gut. So there's a thousand different ones. And the critical thing is to have the thousand. Now, on that, I should say this is a Western gut. What we now know from the work that's been done with the African, remote African tribes, and they've, they've got one, there's a couple of studies done on the hands of people in, in, in Africa and some of the uh, remote people in the rainforest of the Amazon and so on, and they've actually found that they have more gut bacteria. We have already, already apparently lost about 30% of our gut microbiome. It's declining. So, which in theory, according to the studies, suggests that we're more vulnerable to a lot of micro, sorry, a, a lot of illnesses as a result because we don't have that diversity. So we've already lost some. 
And what's interesting too is, is by the way, there, there's, a, there's a Western gut microbiome and there's uh, other microbiomes, all very different. If I took, a, uh, if I took a, uh, an African tribesman, brought him over to Australia, uh, he got sick and we gave him probiotics, he'd get sicker because we're giving him Western probiotics. Now I'm gonna say this and I'll show you later, but our gut microbiome for everybody is different. Everybody, the cultures, the food, every, all these factors are an interplay in the gut microbiome. So we've got over a thousand different species and varieties of microorganisms. And what we wanna do is increase this variety. And if you think about it, what do you think is gonna increase this variety? But the variety of foods that we eat is the best one. The variety of foods we eat. So here's a little hint on my protocol, and I'll mention this again later, is that I take snippets of my veggie garden every day. Just a little bit. A little bit of the rocket, a little bit of the spring onion, a little bit of the lettuce leaf, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. In between my meals, I'm not hungry, I am just getting a greater diversity of plant foods that feed that excess. So it's the diversity of foods you have. The unfortunate thing about Western diet is it's pretty well, you know, grains and starch and meat. And so you can understand why we've lost so much diversity. So in your salads even, don't just do the, um, the, the, the iceberg lettuce, which is a good food, don't get me wrong. But you want three or four different lettuces and a couple of other herbs and spices put in there so you've got variety. Every meal now, you have to look at it and you have to go, oh, that's feeding my gut microbiome. Not you, it's feeding your gut microbiome. And so you're gonna get that diversity of foods in there so that you can feed you, and you can end up with a diverse gut microbiome. We've got about 30 to 40 different species that make up about 99%. So they're the 40 or so, you know, up and down constantly. But what's most important is we've got three or four or maybe even up to a half a dozen that really dominate. Now again, remember, this is a Western culture microbiome. It varies if you're over in a remote area or a remote tribe or in, even in a different country. This is a Western culture. So we'd be pretty well much the same as in the US, UK, New Zealand, which is, by the way, why we all are the sickest populations in the world. It's the best reflection of how well and how sick you are. So ideally, we don't know what the ideal microbiome is. You can't go up to someone and say, well, what, what is it? 10% this, 10% that, 15, 20, 30. We don't know. What we do know is that you've got these 30 or 40 species, you've got uh, three or four to a half a dozen um, uh, uh, major ones, seems like you, you would have heard of, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, they're the ones often put in yogurts or, or, or strains of them are anyway, and clostridium. And you've also got a whole raft of other ones you would have heard of and you'll see along the way. Now, every individual is different and there's a hundred trillion there's a hundred trillion. So this is going to go back to the question that people will often ask me, what's the best probiotic to use? You had a hundred trillion, and this one's got 10 billion. Do your maths. It's a drop in the ocean. It's a drop in the ocean. And it's got a big variety. Well, does that matter? And we'll talk about that so you get an idea of which ones you can select along the way. What's important though, of those hundred trillion, by the way, if you're bigger, you've got more. You might be up to 140 trillion. So, um, but it's all about the balance. What's critical is to have that right balance of the micro, the good ones, the bad ones, the opportunistic, the, the negative ones, the, the, the drifters, having that nice balance in there of all of these ones. And the most important thing in that balance is the variety, the greatest variety, the greater number of the microorganisms. Now, this is a slide. Yesterday I said there were three main functions of the gut microbiome. That was my short talk. Here, here is something I summarised, and, and as you can see, I'm a whiz on PowerPoint. I'm just, I'm just a fantastic. And look, don't you say that guy is hot on graphics, huh? He is so bloody good on graphics. Well, uh, if you want to fix up my slides one day, help me. But you know, I'm, I'm really good on research. I'm, I, I like presenting. Uh, yeah, the graphics part. Uh, I even have a few typos. If you find them, I'll, I'll give you a free book. Okay. <laughs> So the message is, there are, I've, I've, I've isolated eight functions. However, it's really not eight. These are the eight type. There's, there's a, let's say, 120 or 250 different um, functions that you can break it down into if you want to. But I've done the, the top eight. And what's critical here is that each one of these is all related. So you can't separate them out like we do in science. So 
When I talk about digestion, yeah, and, and, then, and that's also going to affect the hormones here, 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 and here. They're all interrelated. But in, in Western science, we like breaking things down in the nice, neat groups. It, it, it's, um, it's called reductionist science. And that's great as long as you look at the big picture where it fits. Now, what we've got in the first one is digestion. And you're, you're going to be amazed at this from an evolutionary perspective, but um, uh, digestion number one. And why I put digestion number one is because 40% of the nutrients that you get in your body come through via your gut microbiome. So you are feeding the gut microbiome who then convert it, activate it, and then send it on to you. So they get the foods and then send it on to you. They also manufacture some of the food. So uh, if you're a vegan, Anyone here a vegan? Good, oh, okay, no one, okay, one, a half, a half of one. That's a full vegan, that's a half a vegan, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're a vegan, you're probably short, you may be short of, um, I think it's vitamin K2. Uh, K2 is what they tend to get in meat and so on, and the gut microbiome produce vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is fantastic for bone health and arterial health. Um, supplementing with that lowers, lowers the calcification in the arteries and puts the calcium from the arteries into the bones where it belongs, which is probably why you need some K2 supplementation, okay? Another topic, another time. So what we've got, all of the minerals, what we find is the gut microbiome, for example, enhances the absorption of a lot of the minerals. Uh, calcium, magnesium, where the study, most of the studies are being done, but also zinc and, and, and the other micronutrients. It increases their absorption by somewhere between about 10 and 40%. So on average, about 25% increased absorption. So if you're iron deficient, if you're iron deficient or you're zinc deficient, first and foremost, work on the gut. gut. Work on the gut. Because it's going to increase the effectiveness of what you're taking in to get it through. So what they do to increase the mineral content, for example, if you have uh, uh, the same amount of uh, calcium and magnesium in a yogurt that you do in a milk, which is a crappy food, a really terrible food, any, any form of milk is terrible, but you know, the, the slim skinnies, uh, half and half, uh, added this, taken away that, homogenized, bastardized, plagiarized, whatever it is, you know, those milks, they're, they're, they're useless. You feed that to an animal, it'll kill them, okay, straight away. So you've got that type, and the same amount of magnesium and calcium, the yogurt absorption will be 25% greater for the minerals. Why? Because it's going in with a microbiome with the enzymes to help with the digestive process. And so the same thing, if you can work on your gut microbiome, you improve the digestion and nutrients for your whole body. And as you'll see for other, other particular parts of it too. Now it also, as a result, it, um, it, it's involved with the metabolism of a whole raft of materials. And again, we're talking, we're, we're talking um, uh, probably hundreds. We're only starting to find out, you know, we know the main ones. And probably the three main ones are, 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 are what are called fatty acids, short-chain fatty acids, FCFAs, if you look at them in the, in the literature, short-chain fatty acids. And most people think, oh, fatty acids are not good for you. Well, let me tell you, here comes your saviour. Here comes your saviour. There's, there's um, two of them, well, three I've got here, lactic acid, uh, butyric acid, there's another one called pro propionic acid or propionate. And these are the ones that are produced by the good bacteria. Well, in particular, the lactic acid, butyric acid, and acetic acid. There's another one I, I should have mentioned, acetic acid. Now, here's a little hint. Ready? What's the best source of acetic acid? But No? Vinegar. Vinegar. What's the second best source of vitamin C? A glass of red wine. So, clearly, you're already thinking, is a glass of red wine good for me? The answer is, one glass is actually beneficial, and a lot of people think it's because, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone out there, I love how science goes. It's got a great antioxidant in it called resveratrol. Why has got this great chemical resveratrol? You've all heard of resveratrol, it's the antioxidant of antioxidants, it's anti-inflammatory, it does all this. Yeah, but you need 300 glasses of red wine to get your daily dose. <laughs> Some of you are going, tonight. <laughs> I could do that tonight, no, not, a, not a problem, okay? The real benefit in red wine is the acetic acid. Because all of the research on acetic acid shows it lowers inflammation by about 25%. And these are approximate, it's going to vary a lot for the individual, but about by 25% overnight, straight away, instantaneously. Now acetic uh, inflammation is the key and the trigger for every single chronic illness you've got. 
So if you want to feed cancer, inflammation. You want to feed heart attack, stroke, diabetes type 2, 1. You want to feed everything, inflammation. So what you want to do is lower your inflammation. And there are great foods to lower inflammation. A classic one to lower inflammation is turmeric. Okay? Oh, by the way, that works via the gut microbiome too. So I'll get a little turmeric uh, drink in there. Um, fantastic, lowers inflammation, works with gut microbiome, win, win, win. So we want to lower the inflammation. And the, the, um, the acetic acid is one of the main ones that do it. So hence why every day you wake up, you actually have a little sip of vinegar, correct? Yeah, diluted in water, otherwise you'll burn your esophagus. And you might think, oh, it tastes like crap, Pete. Eh? You know, hey, I'm sorry, it does, you know. But what you can do is put it in a champagne glass, put an olive in, and try and trick yourself. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work, but try it anyway, it's fun. We tried it for a week and said, nah, we'll just go back to the normal vinegar, diluted a bit of bubbly water, and down it goes, you know. In fact, get rid of the bubbly, bubbly water. Now, one of the other ones here is called butyric acid. That Excuse one. Excuse me, Peter, what type of vinegar? Vinegar, what type of uh, vinegar <laughs> is uh, apple cider, I'm oh, sorry, any type of vinegar, but organic, and with the mother. Now, why we say apple cider vinegar is because we've come from the Western culture and most of the research has been done on apple cider vinegar of, of the Western culture science. But if you go to Japan, it's, uh, uh, it's cherry vinegar. Uh, you go to another place, it's uh, cabbage vinegar. I don't know. It's all, vinegar is just a fermenting, sorry. Vinegar is just a fermented um, carbohydrate. So all, all the thousands of different types of vinegar. So the critical thing is to make sure it's not a mineral like one, the, 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 the one dollar for three liters you get in the, in, the, in the supermarkets. There's nothing, you can see through it. There's nothing in it, okay? You've got to see, and the mother means that it's gonna be a bit murky because that means it's got some prebiotics and some probiotics in it as well. So you take that every single day. If you're a diabetic, you take it before three times a day, one before every single meal. Um, vinegar was used as the main drug for diabetes before pharmaceuticals came in. So in the 50s, everyone was told to have vinegar. And if you go back to any of the old, um, uh, the old books on uh, you know, folk medicine, dating back hundreds of years and stuff, they will all tell you to have a glass of apple cider vinegar. Now, what the, real, what the benefit is, instantly it lowers inflammation, but also it's a normal byproduct of your good bacteria. That's a normal byproduct of your bifido and particularly your lactobacillus bacteria. And what it does is it poisons all, your good ones poison the bad ones when they can, and the bad is the opportunistic one poison the beneficial ones. So this acetic acid sets up the trigger for poisoning the negative ones, the opportunistic ones. So it's a great start in the gut microbiome protocol. Uh, by the way, you can buy Dr. Dingle's brand of apple cider. No, I don't have one. <laughs> But there's some I've seen in the expo already. Go and get some, try it. It's a simple part of the solution. And it's only a five or 10% part to the probiotic protocol, but it's effective, easy, and cheap, isn't it? So that's the whole idea. So some of these. Now, this one, butyric acid, is, is, is another one. And this, this is, um, this is a, a fantastic because it's the best example. The microbiome produced this little chemical called butyric acid. And butyric acid goes into the system, and they, they can, sorry, they further convert it and they end up producing something called GABA. Gamma amino butyric acid. Just go back to GABA. And GABA is the, oh, I'm calm, I'm relaxed. It's the balance, balancing neurotransmitter. So literally GABA is great for kids who are bouncing around. Anyone from a little bit of anxiety or stress, GABA is great. So the good bacteria producing the butyrate, producing the gamma amino butyric acid, which actually goes through our body, gets to the receptors, particularly in our brain. Uh, uh, your, your, by the way, your gut produces most of your neurotransmitters. So understand how important it is. We'll get on to that in a moment. So it goes to your brain and you start to feel calm. Now, a little side to that, butyrate is actually named after a food called butter. Butter, because butter is one of the richest source of butyric acid which is why we like butter. It's calming. It, butter is calming. Margarine is inflammatory. <laughs> butter is cool. Margarine is a toxic chemical. Okay? I'm not worried if it's got a hard foundation tick on it. It's another corporate lie. Remember, this is recorded. I don't mind saying it. It's ridiculous, that type of stuff. So, the butyrate. Now, do, you, do I go on Dr. Dr. Dingle's um, butter protocol for my gut? No. 
It means you can add a bit of butter and when people say, well, what do I fry? And if you're going to have to fry and you need something, add a bit of butter. It's better, much better than all of the other oils out there. And we'll, we'll see if we can get onto that later. But butyric acid, brilliant. So you can see it's producing all these metabolites that can fix work in all the different parts of the body. They send messages all over the body. Now, one of, one of the most important things about the gut microbiome is that it establishes the immune system. And we know that the first three years, the first three years are critical for that healthy microbiome. And apparently, and the, the science on it is really just evolving at the moment because, you know, we're getting so much research now. Although you can alter your gut microbiome and you can change it along the way, the first three years are critical for your gut wall and your micro to talk to each other, to learn the right language, that they speak to each other and that they prefer each other. So once they're embedded in the gut wall, in those first three years, once they're uh, inhabiting it, then it's very, it becomes very difficult to change them. So hence a child who, who um, uh, has the wrong type of gut microbiome in that first three years is going to have health conditions all their life unless they do a whole lifetime of a gut protocol to alter that. So those first three years are so, so critical. And one of the main reasons is it's the gut microbiome that talk to your immune system, that work directly and indirectly to your immune system and stimulate it. Now in your immune system, the, 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 there, are, there, are, there are different ways of looking at it, but there, there's um, one way, is, there's one called the TH2 and the TH1. So the TH2 and TH1. TH2 is your allergies. TH1 is the one that fights viruses, bacteria, cancers. Really good one, this one, yeah? You like, you like the TH1, don't you? Everyone likes the TH1. The problem is TH2 at the moment is hyperstimulated. So the TH2 means we're hyperallergenic. We are hyped up. So this TH2 microbiome, the gut micro, is talking to your immune system and saying, TH2, be ready for the allergies. <clears throat> Have a think. I love this. I love this. This is so smart. So the, so the opportunistic, the toxic bacteria in your gut are telling your immune system to look for the allergies and forget about the bacteria. How smart is that? They're actually saying look for the allergies instead of looking for the bacteria, which they are. They're protecting themselves. So the TH2 is stimulated, so for the rest of your life you are more likely, in the first years, prone to eczema, then allergies, asthma, uh, your, your, your um, uh, peanut allergies, your lactose, all, any form of allergy is stimulated by that TH2. So what we want to do in those first three years of life is make sure that the TH1 is here and the TH2 is here in balance. In balance. It's not trying to get rid of it, it's just in balance. Because at the moment the TH2 is hypersensitive and it's looking for anything to blame and, well, hold on, here comes a little bit of dust my protein that's getting through, I'm going to say that, now I'm going to be sensitised to that for the rest of my life. Now, the work we did, and this was my research group that I was coordinating, some of my honours and PhD students, um, we, you know, we identified really simple things. First of all, in, in the countries that have the highest peanut consumption, they have the lowest rates of peanut allergy. We identified houses that had dust mite, so much dust mite contamination, and they had no dust mite allergy. And we had other houses where the child was born into that literally had extremely low dust mite allergens, something called DER-P1. Gametophores serenissimus is the name of the dust mite, so it's called DER P1. Either that or the scientists went, oh, what are we going to call it? Oh, duh. <laughs> duh. Jeez, I haven't told that joke for a long time. So, <laughs> so message is coming back. So this DER P1 really low, and they don't react to it. Or so they do react to it. So it's not the, the, the chemical that's causing the problem, or the allergen causing the problem. What's causing the problem is the fact that the people, the kids, are hypersensitised. So these hypersensitized kids then go on to develop hay fever and allergy in every single form of allergic disorder unless they get their microbiome back in balance, which is a lot harder after those first three years. So understand, it stimulates that immune system. The immune system is, uh, is involved with you, protected for you for the rest of your life, and that's why we need it. Immune co coordination, uh, inflammation, the main one. Your gut is the biggest source of inflammation, and I've already told you that inflammation is the key to wellness. Lowering your inflammation, fantastic, you need it. Now, inflammation is when you get a, a, a mosquito bite, a, a twisted ankle. It's red and it's sore and you need that because it tells you not to walk on it, right? But after that, 
what happens is the inflammation should go down. In our society, we live in a chronic inflammatory age. The main source of aging in our society is called inflammaging. We don't age, we go through a state of inflammation that makes us look older and feel older. I'm 90. <laughs> That's a lie. That's the only lie I'll tell. Come and ask me if you need to know how old I am, it's all right. <clears throat> so inflammation, so your gut is the major source of inflammation. Again, it's not the only source, so another major source is Weight, excess weight is inflammatory. So hence why you've got, if you've got excess weight and you've got a disturbed gut microbiome which go hand in hand together, then you've got two to three times the amount of chronic inflammation than the average person, which means you've got two to three times the risk of every single form of chronic illness, if I put a few guesswork numbers on it. So if we can lower inflammation in the gut, then we can lower, we can also reduce our obesity. It helps with the obesity, I'll show you that as we go on. So inflammation is in incredible. Then the gut wall. Now, this is part of the trigger and the key of it all. But near all your cells in your body get directly fed from the blood, right? So your heart cells and so on, they get the nutrients, your brain, so on, uh, um, all that. Your gut gets most of its resources, most of its food, its nutrients, directly from the gut, from the gut itself and 50% of it, or roundabout, from the gut microbiome. So your gut microbiome doesn't just feed you up here, it feeds your gut wall. Now, you, you've got to remember, this gut wall, it, you know, it, it's not a bit of plastic, by the way. We used to think, uh, yeah, the digestive system is this rubber tube that goes through, and that's how we've treated it. It's this beautiful interactive, you know, and, and by the way, if you stretch it out and spread it all out, it goes on three, three quarters of a tennis court, I've been told. You know, that's how big it is. Now, I don't know why you want to do that, you know, stretch it out. Anyway, so that's how big it is if you stretch it out and you put it all out there. But what's important about the gut wall, it's interacting with the microbes. And the good microbes protect it. The beneficial ones protect the gut wall. They look after it and they keep repairing it. The bad ones, the opportunistic ones, poison it. They actually start to create gaps in the gut wall, something called leaky gut syndrome, which you would have heard, many of you would have heard, which leads to things like you know, inflammatory bowel, or irritable bowel, Crohn's, or ulcerative colitis, a whole raft of those conditions, but all these other things just too, all the other problems that we'll see along the way. So it protects the gut wall. Physically it protects them, and biochemically it protects them by producing the foods that feed it and, and the poisons that poison the bad bacteria, the, the opportunistic ones. So we've got that beautiful balance in there. Anything wrong and you don't feed it, and guess what? McDonald's don't feed the gut wall. Milk doesn't feed the gut wall. All of these foods we live in a Western society don't feed the gut wall. And you already know what does feed the gut wall, don't you? And we're going to come back to that and talk about it. So that's another important one. Then we've got the epigenetics. You see, up until about, um, oh, I, I suppose, 20 years ago, we all believed that you were determined by your genes. We've got 32,000 genes or 25,000, I don't know how they come up with the different estimates, but they've got these, you know, 32,000 genes, and we were told you are your genes. You know, this person who's overweight, you've got diabetes, and your brother is overweight, his mum and his dad were overweight. By the way, his mum and dad weren't related, I don't think. I hope not anyway. <clears throat> and then, oh look, my dog's overweight and got diabetes too. We now know it's not genetics, and why we know it's not genetics is a hundred years ago the diseases that we have now were minor causes of illness and death and disability. Now they're the major ones. So all we've got to do, diabetes type 2 used to be called aged onset diabetes. And we now have three year olds diagnosed with diabetes type 2. We have breast cancer in teenage girls. You know, we have all these conditions now. And we, you know, so we know it's not in the genes. So what is it? Well, it's in the things that turn on the genes. And these are the chemicals, the stresses in life, the different forms of energy. And one of those is the genes literally in, in the microbes. So they're producing chemicals which affect your gene expression. So they will project, they will produce, the microbiome will produce chemicals which will determine, will help you determine your blood sugar levels as we mentioned earlier. This is pretty amazing. It'll let more sugar in, it'll modulate the manufacture, the metabolism of the sugar and so on. But on top of that, your genes, there are something like um, 150 times more genes in your gut than you have in your body. So if you've got 32,000, multiply by 150, and that's how many genes. And those genes talk to your genes. And those genes coordinate activities around the body. So we now know that 
the biggest part of our genetic material is in our large intestine. Now, this is a hard concept together, but they're actually controlling a lot of the factors to do with you through genetic manipulation. So, because the, your genes don't change, but what they cause brings about changes in the genes. And we can see that some of these gut microbes gut microbe, are talking directly to genes. So this is what's, you know, now the understanding why we know and understand it's so important. Then we've got the nervous system. You've all, all heard of the gut-brain axis, haven't you? Yep. Well, it's one of the popular ones, but it's one of the fractional ones. It's, you know, yes, it's incredibly important, but all these are. The gut microbiome axis is the realisation that the gut has a lot to do with how we function, our brain, our nervous system, how it runs, how it functions from a day to day, minute by minute, day, week, um, all of our activities. So with the gut microbiome, <clears throat> we know that there is a, a nerve going up from the gut to the brain called the, nerve, the, the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is the second biggest nerve system in the body. Outside of the spine, it's the biggest nerve system in the body. So it's really important because of the sheer size of it, right? 90% of the information goes from the gut to the brain. 10% comes down. The 10% that comes down is the butterflies, the constricted, the vomiting. You know, when you're getting stressed or something like that, it shuts it down. Those type of activities. The 90% is all of the other things in there, how you think, moods, anxiety, depression, your, your, your mental focus, act, concentration, activity, all of those things have a role to play from your gut, so through your vagus nerve. Now that's one, but on top of that, your gut produces all these chemicals. Guess where most of your, well, of course, your gamma am amino butyric acid, your GABA is produced? In the gut. Your serotonin? Now what's serotonin, folks? You know that one, don't you? It's the feel-good um, neurotransmitter, right? Where do you think that's produced? In the gut. In the gut. So you, why would you take Zoloft and Prozac and those drugs that have been shown to be pretty well ineffective when you can actually stimulate the production of these chemicals in your gut? And that's a good thing. While you're fixing that, you fix that, you fix that, you fix that, and you fix that all at the same time. Now is that the sole solution for all these mental conditions? No. But I can tell you, it's playing a part in a huge number. And they even know, for example, that if you have some post-traumatic stress, so let's say, I'm sorry, you had some major stress in your life, the results in the post-traumatic stress is that it actually creates dysbiosis in your gut. So from that negative 10% that goes down there, it shuts it down, closes it up, the opportunistic, as soon as it detects the stress hormones, the opportunistic ones go, hey guys, I'm gonna take over. And all those negative bacteria, the opportunistic bacteria, start to take over. So chronic mental, emotional, psychological stress creates the conditions in the gut for the opportunistic bacteria to take over. So you can see the relationship. So what we want to do is, first of all, go in there, a bit of mindfulness, a bit of calming, manage your stress, and at the same time, work on your gut so you're getting the positives going to your brain from both ways. But trying to work on it just with medication isn't going to resolve the problem. What we want to do is work through the whole system. And then here, so we've got, we've got the, you know, all of those um, neurotransmitters, hormones, and here's the hormones, number eight. Your biggest hormone gland in your body is the yeah. gut. It's producing all these hormones which go around your body and actually cause stimulation of your cells and the receptors on the cells. And it's constantly telling it to do things based on the chemicals coming from the gut. So if, you, if you're dominated by, let's say, um, opportunistic bacteria in your gut, you've got too much of the negative bacteria in your gut, then it's, you're constantly producing the hormones that aren't for you. It's for you to do something to feed the gut. It tells you. They coordinate you. They actually tell you, uh, through this axis and this axis, what to eat. The sugar-loving fungi in your gut and bacteria tell you to have sugar cravings. They tell you to, you know, why? Why? Because at the end of the day, they want you to feed. They control us to a degree. We're just the robot. They're in the control well, well, at least partially. At least partially. So do you understand that? That all these hormones, if we want to fix our hormones, start with your gut. Sound pretty simple? Isn't it a simple solution? Fix the gut, fix the gut, fix the gut. And work on the other side of all the, the conditions we've got as well. So here's one, just in terms of, I thought I'd give you a quick example of the metabolism. You know, the, the, the type of chemicals that are produced by the gut and what it does. So the gut, the gut to some degree determines the amount of energy that's absorbed as well. So if you've got the wrong type of um, gut bacteria, the ones that uh, tend to love fat and love sugar and so on, or the microbes, 
then they are able to get more. They think they're able to actually recover more of the energy, put it into your body, and therefore have excess sugar levels in your blood, putting on more weight. So the energy harvesting of your food, to some degree, is determined by your gut bacteria. So the good gut bacteria use it up themselves, flourish, they don't give you as much, and they manage it. They produce the short chain fatty acids, the uh, amino acids, they increase the absorption of ions, they produce biosynthesis of eight B vitamins. So we're probably all deficient in B vitamins one way or another, and even our ability to use the B vitamins is determined by the genes of the bacteria. And what we know is we can actually get these from our gut bacteria. Now, if you're a vegetarian and you struggle to, uh, to produce, is it, uh, is it co cobalamin, but, um, B12? If you're uh, struggling to produce B12 as a vegan and so on, your gut bacteria, same as, uh, as vitamin K. Uh, activation of polyphenols. Polyphenols are all the nutrients that you, or some of the nutrients you get in your plants. Um, these are the ones like uh, uh, the, the EEG in um, green tea in your tea, you're being told. They're the ones in dark chocolate, they're the ones in all these things you've been told that are good for you, okay? Uh, resveratrol and so on. And they activate them. So they turn them on. And then they recycle the bio, bile salts to control fat digestion. And in fact, you'll hear me say this many, many times if you come to any of my lectures, cholesterol isn't the problem, okay? No one has ever died from high cholesterol or bad cholesterol. That's crap. That's rubbish. That's absolute rubbish, and that's just marketing by the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and they can measure it, monitor it, and so everything goes on these drugs. Now, if you're so concerned, you know the best way to fix up your cholesterol levels? Through the gut. Because the bile salts, the bile salts and other factors in there help with the absorption, the reabsorption of cholesterol from the body into the intestine, and so on and so on. So the message is, the gut is the best way to rebalance your cholesterol. Now remember, I'm gonna tell you, nobody's ever died from high cholesterol. It's just an indicator, it's, it's not the problem. It's just an indicator, it's a fire alarm. So my message is fix the gut anyway, and don't worry about cholesterol. No one has ever died from it. And then we look at things like, what? <clears throat> so we've got, we've got a whole picture. You've got a pretty well big picture of, of, of what, the, what it's all like. Do you agree? The benefit, what it can do and how it works. And a couple of people up the back squinting. I'm sorry about the room being uh, pulling you stuck up the back, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it has so many functions that you can no longer ignore it. It's an organ. It's an organ. If it gets sick, you get sick. If it dies, you die. That's how important it is. So what we want to do now is work on it. And when we look at what causes the problems, we've got what are the causes of dysbiosis? And uh, <coughs> The, the, the causes of dysbiosis are really clear. We know the majority of them, except most of us ignore some of the most obvious ones. <coughs> and the first one, a lot of people would have already heard caesarean birth. <coughs> caesarean birth is a major problem, particularly in the Western countries, uh, Australia, UK, US, where we have a lot of, um, uh, what, we, what would you call it, uh, optional caesarean births to fit in with the timetable of the doctor or wherever it is. Um, the problem there is caesarean births are a major issue a major issue when it comes to the gut dysbiosis. And the reason is, when you're born, you pick up the bacteria of your mother, going through the vaginal canal. Now, by the way, in the vagina, the microbes are very different to the ones in the gut. You've got, um, the, one of, let's say, one of the main ones in, in, the, in the gut is uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. In the, in the vagina, because of the change in the pH, the acid level, the acid alkali level, the main one is uh, uh, Lactobacillus rhamnosus G31, or some, some strain, I've forgotten the number. But it's a totally different bacteria that dominates in there. And it's a lot less diverse. It doesn't have the thousand or more. It's got a small number of ones that dominate. Three or four that dominate, that don't dominate in the gut. However, if you want to fix the vaginal pH, sorry, uh, a microbiome, you start with fixing this one to poison the bad ones that are causing it. Thrush is a good example. Uh, of, a, of a, a disease caused by a dysbiosis in your gut and then in the vaginal canal. And the message is when the baby goes through, they pick up, they pick up the bacteria of the mother. Now, if the mother's been on antibiotics, that's gonna be a big problem already. But assuming she hasn't, assuming the mother's been eating well, everything goes well with the birth, they pick up the normal bacteria. Now, if you have a caesarean birth, you pick up the bacteria of the doctor, unfortunately. You pick up the bacteria that's on the plastic and all the sterilized surface, and it's really clear, if you wipe over a surface and get rid of all the bacteria, guess which ones are the first ones to come back? The opportunistic. Particularly in a sterile environment with a lot of sick people around. 
Oh, hospital, hospital. So we've got this cesarean birth, so the message is, in some European countries now they're doing vaginal swabs. So the, the, the baby, even if cesarean, um, it, the swab is taken from the mother's vagina and actually rubbed over, the, rubbed over the baby, so the baby actually has that exposure in there too, which is really sense. And you'll find there'll be a, a vaginal um, uh, uh, capsules at one stage soon too. I have, I have no doubt we'll, we'll, we'll medicalise it somehow, <coughs> make it more sterile. Then we can't do much about how we were born, but we can influence the people around us to at least understand that. Uh, there are some probiotics, and there's a lot of studies now, there are some probiotics you can get from zero to six months of age, which are the, the good ones, but nothing beats the, the, the combination of the ones that you get from the mother. Remember, it's not, it's not just the, uh, the, the, the one or two dominant, it's that variety, that huge number that balance in there. Um, antibiotics and uh, other, other treatments and medications are huge. The unfortunate thing about our kids nowadays is by the time they're two, they've had between six and eight doses of antibiotics. And usually for conditions that don't require antibiotics. Now there's a big push because it's creating huge problems. It's creating huge medical problems down the line in terms of resistance to uh, um, bacterial resistance to uh, illnesses and so on. End of the day, we're much better off dealing with the illnesses through nutrition and lifestyle rather than dishing out. Now, the latest research, only a couple of months ago, showed that taking it, you don't have to take the antibiotic dose to the full extent. You can actually stop it as soon as your conditions start to improve. Now, the doctors will say, go here, but I'm just reciting what the best studies in the world show. And the studies show as soon as your conditions have improved, you can actually stop your antibiotic um, use. Again, published in the most repu reputable scientific journals. Now, unfortunately, our doctors don't get access to them. They get access from the pharmaceutical companies who want them to keep using the, the, the pharmaceuticals. So, uh, poor diet, excess weight, obesity, all linked in there. There's no doubt about it. There's this negative cycle. There's a negative cycle about the, the brain too, you know. If you're stressed, you create the conditions for the opportunistic bacteria, which create the opportunistic uh, stress levels. The same with obesity. If you put on a lot of weight, then it affects your gut. In fact, a seminal study back in 2006, in the, in, again, in this journal called Nature, they followed a group of people over a period of time, over years, and they found that as they put on weight and got sicker, their gut bacteria changed. Now, their first hypothesis was, well, maybe, maybe it's the putting on weight changes the gut bacteria. Or is it the gut bacteria causing them to put on weight? When they came to the end of the study, the main thing was it's the gut bacteria causing them to put on weight. So some form of dysbiosis led them to put on weight. Now, it's probably a combination of two, but the gut bacteria being the most important one for putting on weight for most people. So they found that. And by the way, there are hundreds of studies now linking weight gain with the gut microbiome. So we, you want to lose weight? Fix the gut. You want to do it? Fix the gut. And then you start to do the weight. We, we run a, I run a, you know, a classes on weight loss and so on. And one of the, the, the third thing we talk about, that's how important it is for weight loss, is the gut microbiome. Fix the gut microbiome. Uh, overeating and poor eating habits, uh, whenever you boom, dump all that stuff down, you, you're putting a huge amount of stress on your gut, it's not meant to deal with it. We tend to overeat a lot, we tend to eat big meals a lot, we tend to eat poor foods a lot, processed foods a lot, and all those other things that go in it. Uh, illness and, and food poisoning, obviously, one stress and emotions I've, I've mentioned quite a few times already. Uh, aging and hormones, as we age, our gut bacteria tends to change. Now the problem with those studies at the moment, they're following normal people. And they're seeing that as they age, their gut bacteria changes. But the problem is, so does their lifestyle and diet. The average pensioner in Australia has a sandwich with jam for dinner. Do you agree? You know, unlike when they were 20 years younger with the family, they would have their five veg and their three thing, you know, their 10 pieces, here's a hint, their 10 pieces of plant food a day mixed in 10, 10 things, they, will have, they virtually have none. So I don't know there if it's, I, I think it's more the food that they're eating is changing their gut microbiome as their age rather than the other way around. Food additives and preservatives, I'll touch on that. Excess alcohol and drugs. One of the things they found in a very large study recently was that the, they could tell the people who drink more wine. Because uh, although wine comes with acetic acid, which helps balance it out, and it comes with resveratrol, but you have to have, have a lot of it, right? Um, it also comes with something called alcohol, and alcohol is a poison, hence if you want to sterilise the surface, put alcohol on it. 
So drink the low alcohol drinks rather than the high ones and, uh, uh, and, and limited and so on. So exposure to toxic substances and this one that uh, uh, a, a lot of people really aren't even aware of, but everything out there influences in here. So if it's air pollution, whether it's a spray, uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll go through a few of those, affect our gut. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that we reduce these conditions. This is not a complete list. These are the major ones. And so if you want to get your gut right, and a lot of people say, oh, I'll just take the probiotics. No, not unless you're doing this as well. And again, you can't do much with the birthing processes at the moment or the first three years of your life, but cleaning. Here's a, here's a classic one. All, this, all these adverts out there about um, you know, consuming uh, more and more of these things to put on all the surfaces and so on, get rid of the bugs. Uh, this one kills 99.99% .99 of the bacteria and that one kills, you know. And then they've got the other one with the chicken leg, they wipe over the table. You're probably better off wiping chicken leg than you are these antibacterials. Because every antibacterial you use, you ingest. Every antibacterial in there upsets the ecology. When you wipe over a bench to get rid of the bacteria on the bench, and it's nothing wrong with the bench. Look at it. Okay, yes, if you, if you, if you want to get rid of 99% of the bacteria on the bench, you know what you do? You use water. You use a sponge and water. Rinse it in warm water, sponge it over. If you want to get carried away, use soap. If you want to get really excited, use vinegar. How simple is it? Why would you spend so much money on all these antibacterials which are upsetting the whole ecology of that bench? Because what are the bacteria that come back first? The opportunistic ones. And where's, who's the biggest source of bacteria in the home? You. You. You've, you've got, oh, what is it, 100 million bacteria on your hand or something? So every time you touch the bench, you pollute it. So from now on, you're gonna go around like this. <laughs> Wipe the bench, do the cooking. Crazy, ridiculous. You are the biggest source, but what, hopefully, because of your gut microbiome being imbalanced, your skin microbiome is in balance too. And on the topic of skin microbiome, some recent research has actually shown that a, a disturbed, at least part of eczema, is caused by a disturbed um, skin microbiome. A part of it, most of it comes from the gut, but a part of it is coming from the skin microbiome as well. So again, why do you want to use these chemicals to disturb your skin microbiome? They protect you, they look after you, they keep you your balance, they keep the right pH. Yeah, you got, got, might have a problem in certain areas <coughs> that, that smell a little bit. Wipe them over. Don't use antibacterials and preservatives and things like that in there. Get rid of this. You can smell how toxic this is when you walk down this aisle in the supermarket. It stinks. Now, you are breathing it in. All of these chemicals, all of them affect the gut microbiome, as well as lots of other things in there. Then we've got, then we've got all of these toxins that we put on our skin. And they've got things like parabens and phthalates, which are, which are how they make it a bit creamier, and uh, some of the parabens are, are, are preservatives and so on, uh, antimi antimicrobial, and every single time, 90% of the ingredients you put on the skin, I'm assuming you're in, well, well, uh, very knowledgeable in this area, so I'm only saying 90%, for the average population, 95% of the stuff that they put on their skin. And what you've got to understand is we've increased our consumption of these products so it's not just, it's a shampoo, but I don't use shampoo personally. <laughs> I've given up hair care products, they are deadly, okay? So moving away from that, all of these have preservatives and antimicrobials and chemicals which disturb, not just your gut, but your, also your hormone balance, which then disturbs the gut, which then comes back at you. So a lot of these chemicals in here are what are called uh, um, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So they upset your hormones, in particular thyroid and estrogen. And then that, the estrogen levels, the gut reads these high estrogen levels and it says, whoa, you know what the gut likes? You know what loves estrogen levels? Candida. Some of the sugar loving bacteria, which then go, wow, lots of estrogen. I'm gonna proliferate and knock out the good ones. So everything we do affects us, everything we do. So we need to understand. Then we've got gut this way as you add diet. Too much sugar, our white grain diet. You want to get sick, you eat these foods. If you've got a blueberry muffin, have the blueberry, chuck away the muffin. Get rid of it. Grains are notorious, and not just because they're sugary processed foods, and whenever you process stuff, you add chemicals, and even if you don't, as soon as you process it, you change the chemical structure of it. And then you're feeding the gut microbiome that like muffins. And the Maasai tribe, 
And the, the Bantu tribe in the middle of the Amazon never have muffins. They don't eat grains. They don't eat the foods that, that we eat. Hence, their diversity is much bigger. We've got all the grain-eating, sugar-eating bacteria that we've got. We go, wow. And then we wonder why we're sick. So we've got to get off these foods. We've got to get off, even the protein. You know the protein that they put in, in these um, protein-enriched foods? It's gluten. Gluten plays havoc with your gut microbiome and your gut, and that's the one that's linked with celiac disease and people who have conditions doesn't even manifest as celiac disease, but gluten intolerance and stuff. And I'd suggest everyone to a degree has a problem with gluten. And guess what they put in it? Enhanced protein. They put in gluten. They take it out of all the gluten-free products and put it in these other ones. They're so conscious of your health, aren't they? Don't you love these big companies? And so all those protein-enriched breakfast foods, and I, I think they're, I actually I am writing a book one day called Cereal Killers. <laughs> They kill your gut and they slowly poison you. So get off the cereals, get off the processed cereals. Margarine is a deadly food. It's no good for the gut. It's highly inflammatory. It's, an in, it's a highly processed omega-6 fatty acid, which means inflammation, 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 which means chronic illness. So please, please understand. Then we've got our toxic foods or anything that's baked, fried, Anything that's processed, the more you process foods. Now, I'm not saying don't have processed foods. But what I am saying is don't have all of this and think you're having a good diet. Oh, it's got bran in it. Oh, it's got this in it. No, what you want is have a bit of that, but have the unprocessed, the other good foods that I'll, I'll mention briefly as we go through. And then, of course, the next one is your water, which has fluoride, which is a bacterial poison, chlorine, which is a bacterial poison. They've got the heavy metals, which is a bacterial poison, and you'd all be aware of um, Aldi's recall uh, on their taps, which mean uh, excess lead, not just lead, excess lead was coming from the Aldi taps. Uh, again, excess lead from all your, you get these heavy metals and all of them are gut poisons. So, yes, we need water, but what we need to do is make sure we get better. Then we've got these preservatives and things that are added in them. Every single one of these, <clears throat> and it doesn't matter which one, preservatives, uh, these three here, are typically antimicrobial anyway. They're designed to preserve it by stopping either the enzyme or the bacterial activity, the microbial activity in the food. That's why they're actually called, you know, antimicrobials. So your nitrates, particularly in meats. So any of your processed foods are huge in it, your, even your... Um, uh, your minced meat and so on, the redness in it is preserved by the, the nitrates. Uh, sulfates, they, they put on a lot of the, the, the veggies and so on, salads and so on, to keep them fresh in, in the room. So that's why you, you wash them and so on. All of these things are antimicrobial. Then these ones, although they're not antimicrobial, all of these ones here disturb the gut microbiome. All of them disturb the gut microbiome. And the best one are the artificial sweeteners. And not saccharin in this case. But, um, you know, the NutraSweet and the Splendor and all those, can't name a brand, because I'm videoing it, right? These ones have been shown not only to cause people to put on weight and mice in the mice studies, but also to lead to an increase in the risk of diabetes type 2. And how it does that, people are saying, but hold on, there's no calories. How it does that primarily is through the gut dysbiosis. They are good gut bacteria poisons. They're the beneficial gut bacteria poisons. They're poisoning, they're changing it. They're making in the opportunity for the opportunistic bacteria. So any of these, you get off. Even when you emulsify food, which is when you mix water and fat together, it changes the whole structure of the gut microbiome. So if it's got a food, additive, colour, anything like that, unless it's a vitamin, forget it. Is that pretty clear? And that's what we're doing constantly. We need to become very much aware of that. Then of, course, then, of course, we've got stress. Stress permeates our society. If I, oh, listen, you know, we're at a mindfulness conference here, right? So everyone's pretty calm, aren't they? Put your hand up if you've got stress in your life. <laughs> Some people are laughing and looking at the next person. <laughs> he has stress. <laughs> she has stress. And the answer is yes, we do have stress, but the stress should be going up and down, up and down. Like in the old days when we were being chased by a bear or a thunderstorm or a flood coming, we panic, we worry. But now we worry all day. We worry about the finances. This is, this is a product of our politicians, by the way. And they go, we worry about our finances. We worry about are you going to have enough money. I'm going to live to 115 years of age. I've got to say, I'm going to work up until 90. 
to make sure I've got enough money so where I'm at. And by the way, I'm already 90, remember? I told you that. <laughs> so, you know, we've got all these added stresses in our life, the relationship stresses, and then when you watch television and the media, people being killed and bombed and, you know, whatever else is happening, it's all stress. It's all stress if you think, oh, the media doesn't affect me. It does. Every time you read those negative stories, it creates a level of stress. You can't separate out yourself from what you're seeing because you, you are actually engaging in it in some way. As soon as you do, your body is reading it as stress. So that's why, why I say don't listen to the media anymore. Don't turn on the media. Uh, look for things that are fun because it's the positive things in your life which create the positive. Now, the, the way negative stress works is it actually sends that 10% of the vagus nerve going from the brain to the gut. It sends it down to change the whole physiology of it and also the biochemistry. So anyone suffering from chronic stress is instantly altering the conditions in the gut microbiome which become an ideal ground for the opportunistic bacteria. So as a result of the opportunistic bacteria then, they start to take over, they push out the good ones and you've got the bad ones continually growing and taking over and that makes you feel more stressed and anxious so therefore it's a vicious cycle. So the way to break that vicious cycle is twofold. One, Learn to manage your stress. So a little bit of meditation, a little bit of calm, deep breathing, a whole raft of things. You work in gratitude into your life, a whole raft of things. Set your goals. And on the microbiome side, you see, this isn't just trying to fix here. It's about fixing here that affects your gut. And on the microbiome side, high dose probiotics to make sure you're getting the positive messages going up to there and doing our probiotic protocol, e.g. vinegar and all these other things so that you actually get that diversity in there to help calm you from both directions. So just doing meditation is not going to be enough. Just doing the probiotics isn't going to be enough. Do them both at the same time. It's a positive loop then, and you're in a positive loop rather than the negative loop. Building a, a gut microbiome. Okay, so some of these ones. Breastfeeding, first three years important. Digestion and supplementation, looking at our environments, genetics and aging. And I'm going to skim through some of those now so that you get a little bit of a snapshot of those. And again, this one's a little bit hard that we can't go back there and... Um, but we, we, we had a, 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 young, a young baby in the, in the back of the room, so very, very important. And all we've got to do, she's from an evolutionary perspective, look at something like breastfeeding. So, you know, it's almost as though the baby is designed to actually have human milk. You know, that's sarcasm, by the way. But the way we're sold it nowadays, you know, yes, we're supposed to, and the best thing, the World Health Organization actually says breastfeeding to five years of age. I say at least to one or two years of age, so that doesn't mean exclusively, but the research is pretty good on it. Because it's the first three years of life which will determine that. And the latest studies are actually coming through and showing that you're, even though you're born caesarean, if you get the right length of breastfeeding with the right breast milk, the ingredients in it, then it can actually create the right microbiome. So even if the worst conditions occur right at the beginning, you can recreate it. And why this happens is because the gut, you, you, you know about you know, the, the human milk passing, passing on some um, immunological components so you know, uh, we can, they can fight off illnesses and so on. They don't have an, a developed immune system. Uh, <clears throat> so you, know, you produce, your, the mother produces the, the immune globulins and things that fight off viruses and bacteria and so on. Hence why babies don't die at birth or in those first few years. But what's even more important is that the breast milk is designed to feed the gut bacteria. 40%, or at least some estimates, up to 40% of the gut microbiome is actually designed to feed the... Sorry, 40% of the breast milk is designed to feed the gut microbiome. 40%. This is huge. That's why earlier on, if you look at it, 40% of your... Remember when I talked about digestion, number one? 40% of your digestion, around about, plus or minus, goes through your gut. The same here. But your gut microbiome is designed to actually get components out of breast milk that the baby can't use. It's producing 40% of its food and the baby can't even use it. Where does it go? Through the gut microbiome. How smart is that? Then on top of that, every time the mother breastfeeds and leaves the baby out, the bacteria stay on the, on the nipple and start to breed up. So every time the baby goes back on the nipple, they get a dose of probiotics. This is fantastic. It's almost evolution, in, you know, working effectively. This is what it should be. But what happens now? Get the wet ones, the white ones, and then wipe your breast, get off, get those bacteria off our skin. No, 
And the body, the baby held close to the, to the mother, gets the whole skin bacteria as well. And by the way, your skin bacteria is pretty well determined by your gut bacteria. I know you're very hygienic people. I know you wipe and do everything and wash your hands and do everything properly, but we still carry our gut microbiome on our hands, everywhere on our body. So the important thing is to get that well, so that this is well, so that the rest of it is well, and then the baby's well too. So they're constantly exposed to that healthy skin, gut microbiome. And so we know all of these foods. And so they, you, you, the, in breast milk, you get a whole group called um, uh, galactose oligosaccharides, GOSs, which, which are literally prebiotics, the foods to feed the probiotics. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Isn't that just amazing when you think about evolution? Now, how do you create a good gut microbiome after that? It all comes down to digestion. And I don't have time to go into the digestive process, um, except, except that it's so important to get digestion right. And it starts, well, digestion starts well before the, uh, the mouth because we smell the foods. It starts to produce salivary enzymes and digestive juices and we start thinking, mmm, McDonald's, fish and chips, processed foods, whatever it is. Funny thing, apples and oranges don't smell much, do they? You don't walk past and go, apples, oranges, nuts, the good foods. But let's say it starts here in the mouth and chewing. The chewing of the food, which is something we no longer do. I was at a zoo in uh, Rockhampton. We, we do a, a tour around uh, North, well, basically Queensland every year. And last year we were there, we were in Rockhampton. We went to the Rockhampton Zoo. Really pretty little zoo and really nice. And uh, there was a chimp, a big chimp family. And uh, it was really amazing watching them just eat. They ate. And one of them, I was watching constantly for half an hour and he was eating the rind of an orange. Now, is anyone here who spent a half an hour on an orange, a whole orange? Five minutes, probably two minutes on an orange. Peel it, eat it, chuck it away, right? It's gone down. I had a mandarin yesterday, it was probably 30 seconds. So what was the difference? They take their time to chew. They take their time. Every culture, every, every culture in the world, except ours, which has no culture in our gut, says take your time, eat slowly, relax, be calm with eating, all those things. We don't, we gulp it all down, we're so far. And we don't chew our foods, we've got to chew our foods, we've got to macerate it, we've got to break it down. And then we also have to create the, the conditions in our body that enable digestion. Stress shuts down your digestive system. When you're stressed, you can't digest properly. So you actually got to be a bit calm here. And then it goes down through the system. And why do I say that? Because if you want to give the good bacteria the right type of food, it's not just the right type of food, it's the fact that you're pre-digesting it to the state that the bacteria can actually use it. So that they're using it at an optimal level, which means breaking it right down. And then going through this whole system. Um, enzymes, this one's hydrochloric acid. One of the biggest problems in Western society is gourd. It's reflux, it's these conditions that people have. And uh, it's really simple. About 95%, 99% of them are caused by not enough acid. Not too much. And so they will give you, when I say they, the drug companies will give you these antacids and they'll give you drugs that stop the production of hydrochloric acid, which means you are on them for the rest of your life. Even though they say they should be on them for just a short time. Um, at the end of the day, it's increase the acid to improve digestion. Your stomach acid needs to be a pH of about one to two. If it's three or four, then it can't break it down, so it goes in your stomach and goes blub, 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 and you get this reflux happening. And why is that important? Because you need the stomach acid to break down the foods to feed the gut microbiome. Then what else do you need? Well, in terms of the, the things, water, 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 but good water, there is no doubt. You know, when it goes into your system, these the, 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 the system in there works on, on, a, on a wet, um, moist environment. It's not dried out and your body takes as much water out as it can. And so if I go back to the first premise I said, if, if you know, you're having troubles pooing, and if I talk about that briefly, you know, some people say, yeah, the first one is regularity, and people go, oh yeah, I'm regular, I go once a week. Yeah. If you have food two or three times a day, you go one or two times a day. If you're not, then you need to work on everything from the hair to the gut microbiome, which all works in conjunction. That's why I'm going through digestion, why I went through digestion, because they, they all work hand in hand. You can't ignore what goes on. You can't just dump probiotics and think it's going to work if you don't chew or eat the right foods. So it's about developing a whole system to look at this. So you've got to have water and you've got to have the right type of water to make sure it's the right ones, it's not poisoning. Then I'm, I'm going to highlight this one, raw foods, raw foods, raw foods. 
Why raw foods? Because at the end of the day, every raw food is a small dose of probiotics. Whereas all your packaged foods are sterile. They've been uh, hydronized, they've been sterilized, they've been everything. There's no, no life in them, no enzymes, no bacteria in them. And yet, when you have a raw food, and you eat that bit of raw food, you eat the carrot, which is my morning tea this morning at a conference, that's what we've got to have. You have the carrot, you have the carrot, you have all the bacteria on the outside of it. So I'm getting a dose of a million, sorry, 10 million bacteria. Now, which bacteria are they? Usually the ones used in fermentation anyway. They started to break it down very slowly at the beginning. But every bit of raw food is a small dose. And if you do it all your lifetime, it's a huge dose. Every little bit counts. Raw food. Raw food also comes with the enzymes to digest itself. So it makes digestion easier on your body, which means it's then prepared better for your gut microbiome in the last part, which is your large intestine. Nutrient-dense foods. And what do I call nutrient-dense food? Your gut, gut bacteria thrive and survive and need nutrients as much as you do. So every time you feed them a white, pasty, uh, processed food, you're starting to kill off. They're starving. You're starving your good bacteria. So what you need to do is go for all of the vitamins, the minerals, the essential fatty acids, all of those. And on top of that, all of those plant nutrients, the flavonoids, what are called uh, polyphenols, and the flavonols, the flavonoids, and a whole group of these things you find in every one of the different colours of veggies and, and nuts and beans and everything in there. So you have the nuts, and the nuts are rich in the right type of fats that the gut loves, and they're body love. And the beans are rich in certain types of fibre that promote your good bacteria for the first week, hence you make enemies in the first week and because you're farting everywhere. <laughs> um, and as your gut re, uh, uh, adjusts. Oh, by the way, there, there is one proviso. If you have a, a, a serious gut issue, um, uh, inflammatory bowel, um, uh, colitis, uh, what's called SIBO, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, um, uh, what else, is any of Crohn's, any of those, then you may not start. You probably don't want the high fibrous foods. Okay, and that's another issue. Come and talk to me later and I'll, 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 I'll give you some hints there. But you actually stay off it in the beginning of our protocol. So the nutrient dense food, and here I'm going to put in one of the nutrients, the most important nutrients for the gut microbiome is the fibre. Is the fibre, fibre, fibre. Every food has to have fibre in it. Look on the ingredients. If it doesn't have fibre, it's not a food. So you need fibre. So make sure it's got the fibre in it. So I supplement with a little bit of fibre, mixed fibre. I don't just add fibre three times a day. I get a high quality fibre. Um, some of the fibres you can buy in the chemist have uh, colourings, preservatives. Um, and they've got a whole raft of things which are feeding the whole role of the fibre. And the fibre should be a mix too. There's a, there's a, there's a group that I'll mention in a moment called um, prebiotics. And then there's ones that the, the, the gut bacteria can't even break down. They all work hand in hand. So nutrient dense foods including fibre. Probiotics, they're the gut bacteria obviously, uh, or the gut microbes. You can also get some that are fungi, things like Saccharomyces that are fungi, uh, that help re-inoculate the gut or the help on the way through. The prebiotics which feed them, fermented foods and symbiotics which are a combination of these two. And if we go here, toxic water, we've got to get rid of these, the stuff in our water. Are there pesticides? Yes there are. Uh, we did a study for um, uh, a water corp a long time ago. They don't even know what's going in water. And in fact, they don't even know how to measure it in some cases. So, and when you look at pesticides, one of the best ones we know is Roundup, glyphosate. Uh, it's, an anti it's an antibacterial, it's an antibiotic. Glyphosate destroys the gut bacteria. So even a small amount in your food as a contaminant destroys your gut bacteria. Yeah, I know that the, the, the authorities say it's safe. Rubbish. All the authority decisions are made by vested interests and the, those vested interests aren't necessarily yours. Pesticides, organic chlorine molecules, aluminium, copper, lead, and of course, we add fluoride. My one comment about fluoride is, we put fluoride in, which is a gut poison, which is a bacterial poison, an enzyme poison, because supposedly, I'll say supposedly, because in science it's not clear, it helps with tooth decay. But what causes tooth decay? What one food causes tooth decay? Sugar, sugar. okay? so. One food, sugar, causes a tooth decay. So let's put fluoride in the water. See the logic? There is no logic. Yet if you take fluoride out, if you government was serious and took sugar out and started mandating and regulating and more than anything educating about sugar, then we would reduce every single form of chronic illness from cancer to cardiovascular disease to tooth decay. But they don't want to because of vested interests. But let's put fluoride in the water. 
and we know it's a mind dumbing poison. We do know that. And come to one of my other lectures, I do a two hour lecture just on fluoride. So, uh, message is simple. So, what are nutrient dense foods? They're the nuts and the seeds, they're the veggies, they're the beans, they're the fruits. All of those in combination. And the great thing about the nuts and seeds, they've got the fiber, they've got all of the nutrients to feed the gut microbiome. So don't take the probiotics if you're still having white bread, please. Don't take the probiotics if you're having white cereal. You're sending the bacteria on a suicide mission. They're gonna get there and say, nothing to eat, ah! So you have to feed them at the same time. That's why what I'm saying is about a protocol how we do it all and all of these and of course my, my, my absolute favorite is using smoothies we live on smoothies now I used to be a fanatical juicer up to about five years but what does juicing take out the fiber and fiber is just as important as any other vitamin group in there so I make sure I get all of the fiber and we do our smoothies at home um, uh, they are great for me and they're great for my gut microbiome because they break them down. Remember, some of you are probably saying, Pete, but you know, the great apes didn't have them. Did they? No, but they also chew their food for a half an hour. You don't. So what it does is it breaks it into food. Now, if you've got acid reflux, one of the best foods is to start off on is the smoothies. Uh, that, by the way, is the blood pressure smoothie that lowers blood pressure within about two weeks of taking it. And the ingredients, just quickly, uh, beetroot, almonds, linseed, and banana to make it taste nice. And at the end of the day, it's a great gut microbiome um, smoothie as well. Because it's got a diversity. The greater the number of things in there, the greater the foods you've got to feed, the greater diversity and variety of microbes. See how the equation works. So we live on smoothies, our grandkids live on smoothies. Um, benefits of raw food, they're prebiotic, so they've got the food in it. They're probiotic, they've got the bacteria in there, and they're rich in enzymes that help digest the food to feed your gut microbiome as well. And again, we use smoothies, smoothies, smoothies all the time. Taking probiotics and symbiotics, what's the question? Well, there's a whole debate going on. Should I take this one with 27 and a half strains? That one's got three varieties extra. This one's got you know, lactobacillus, da, da, da. This one's got bifidobacteria, da, da, da. And the answer is, there is no answer. But the first thing to remember, you are from a Western society, so the main ones you get are the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus. In Africa, uh, the, um, the Hansa tribe in Africa, virtually uh, bifidobacteria were non-existent. So if, uh, as I said earlier, giving someone who's been out in a remote African tribe for a while, comes back to Australia, giving them a Western probiotic with bifidobacteria will make them sicker. So it's understanding these are Western culture probiotics. So they're the ones we use. And it's about what it appears to be is that the highest dose, now remember you've got 100 trillion plus microbes in your gut. Dropping 10 billion on them is a drop in the ocean. What you've got to do is the protocol, the vinegar, the aloe vera, the things that upset the negative, the opportunistic bacteria, and at the same time, start to feed the good bacteria. And then you dump huge amounts of probiotics, and it only has to be two strains. The two strains, a trillion of them, or around about that many, to knock them out, to knock the negative ones out. And then what they found after one month the two strains reproduce rapidly, but then they create the conditions for the other good bacteria. So in one study where this was done, the two strains, of one strain of bifido and one strain of lactobacillus came back and a month later, high levels, high levels, because they're taking high doses. And then they found in the second month, all these other strains started to reappear as well. Particularly the one that I mentioned earlier, the Akkermensia minisophilia, the AM. So, the good ones support the good ones, the opportunistic ones kill the good ones and support the, the opportunistic bad ones. So hence, a high dose is the best on dumping. Now you've probably heard about yogurt, what should we do with yogurt? The, the answer is, yogurts are okay, they're not great. And they're not great, one, because they're dairy. Now they are better than any other form of dairy because they're being livened. They've literally got the enzymes to help with digestion. But then most of the yogurts we get nowadays are literally pretty limited in, in, in their live bacteria content and so on. And this is a, a little study we did about eight years ago. Hence my interest in this topic, you know, has been 20 years. 
It's just that now there's so much more to read on, on the topic that, you know, when we did a little study, we actually sent the results over, sent some yogurt over to a lab um, in Sydney to do the analysis, because there was only one lab that could do it back then. And, and we, we looked at the various yogurts, and we've got 2 million in there, 120 million, 300 million, 410. Then we get down to the good ones, and we've got 11, so that's a million there. We've got 11 billion, 18 billion, 19 billion. See the difference? It's a thousand fold difference. Yogurts aren't yogurts. The smaller the container, the less the yogurts. The more sugar added, the less the, the more processed, the less the, the bacteria in it. So what we've got to do is get the ones that are pot set. Now the ones down the bottom, I think are only Western Australian brands. Oh, by the way, they sponsored the study. <laughs> <laughs> However, I was independent in doing it, okay? Ah, uh, and I still don't get a free yogurt from them. So there are no vested interests. I don't get yogurt from them. Um, so the message is, it's, it's the pot, what we found out, most importantly, it was the pot set ones that are the best ones because the little ones get a lot more handling and believe it or not, the bacteria are very fragile. So what, what we've got to do is, is create the nice conditions for them. And then we go on to say, okay, so that's it. You know what, the pot set yogurt, if you want some, have some pot set yogurt. That's one of the things you can do. And this is the... Sorry, mate. does it matter with cow, goat or sheep? Probably not. Probably not. I know a lot of people, um, thanks for asking that, because a lot of people will also <coughs> say, um, what about my homegrown yogurt? The answer is, it's probably going to be a lot less than this. And the reason is because the, 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 the yogurt bacteria, the bacteria we put in there, often bifidobacteria and lactobacillus and um, some staphylococcus and a few others in there, are very fragile in normal conditions. Although they get through to our gut, or a lot of them get through to our gut, they're fragile out there in the environment, in the yogurts and so on. And, and so when you're at home and you're processing it more, it means you actually get a drop in, you get a drop in the, in the uh, probiotic count of them. So I don't know exactly how many, but... Um, and here we are, the fermented foods. And this is the easiest one. This is a win-win. You get the same concentration in these as you get in the yogurts, or more, and you get a greater diversity. Now, the type of bacteria that's on the fermented ones are, are fairly common strains that naturally occur on the foods that are already starting to break it down in nature. All you do in fermented foods is give them the right conditions to ferment, and then you go along and have them. You eat them, you drink them. And the message here is all of these have slightly different combinations. It's a really cheap and effective way. They're all, because they've been fermented, have some acetic acid in it too, which is beneficial. So you're getting that dose which helps control the microbiome. It's a win-win situation. They've also got foods that feed the bacteria, so they've got the prebiotics in them too and the fibre, it's a really good win-win situation. So, and every single culture in the world, except Western culture, has these cultures. If we don't have the culture in our gut, they have the culture in their food, and they do. And um, there's, a, there's a couple of stalls around there, you know? And here's one with kimchi. Go, go visit the lady and talk about it. Lovely lady, and she'll talk about the kimchi, uh, and she's just opposite our stall, right beside our stall. And so you can have a chat to her about it. It's a great probiotic, prebiotic um, food that helps control the negative bacteria in the gut. It's a really good balance. And they're cheap and effective and you can make your own really easily. Uh, kombucha is another one. Um, you, you know the names of them. You, you can make your own really, really simply. So that's what we get onto. And, and this, is, this is what I said, the acidic acid bacteria. So um, kombucha, milk kefir, water kefir. Um, we, by the way, also do a coconut yogurt at home. And all we do is get one of the good brands of yogurt, take a spoonful, mix it in with some coconut cream and ferment it for a couple of days. And we've got this beautiful coconut yogurt, which by the way, has got those the really good um, uh, medium chain fatty acids that are great for your own body and great for the gut bacteria. Sourdough bread is the best bread to have. So when, when we have bread at home, it's a, it's a, a, a loaf of, of, of sourdough rye bread and we have one loaf over a week instead of in the old days, you know, one loaf a day. So we get the sourdough and that's pre-digested with the acetic acid bacteria. And then we've got vinegar, a natural product that's been used for diabetes, um, cardiovascular cancer, and all of these things, vinegar, vinegar, vinegar. It's a win-win situation. So again, any of these acetic acid um, bacteria products that we get, fermented cheese, here's a win. I can see some of you going, yeah, that's good. I like my fermented cheese. Now, don't go on the Dr. Dingle's butter and fermented cheese diet. <laughs> okay? It's still a treat. Oh, it's got fat in it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But you have the fermented cheese. The older the cheeses, the crumbly, the more mature cheeses. Um, and someone said, what about, uh, what about the, the, the blue vein? No. 
They may taste nice and they've got uh, the fungi in them, but they're, they're not the fungi that you want in them. Uh, eat them if you like, if your gut's really good, but at the end of the day, you're much better off having these older cheeses. Now, there was a, a couple of interesting studies recently also showing the, thin, the, the more plastic wrapping on them, the more of the contaminants from the plastic are going into the cheese as well. So get the big blocks, okay, cut it up, grind it up, grain it up and put it on your food yourself. Much easier, much safer. You can, don't get the contaminants and you get some of those. Don't, obviously, if you're cooking them, you're gonna kill the bacteria, add it on the top of the food, you're gonna get some of the probiotic potential of it. Prebiotics, these are the foods that feed it. Um, typically, you've got uh, everything, the best ones are probably your onions and your garlic, um, leeks, any of those. They've got, they're, they're rich in, a, in something called um, inulin, uh, 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 your oligolactose, fructo, uh, oligolactose um, uh, your whole raft of these substances that feed the, the gut bacteria, the prebiotics, um, your fruit, you know, every, every form of fruit and nuts and seeds and beans and all those have these foods that feed them. So what you're after is getting as, as many of these as possible to feed the bacteria, to feed the bifidobacteria, the lactobacillus bacteria, um, things like your uh, um, uh, potato, your sweet potato is rich in any of the earthy foods. Again, potato a little bit, but unfortunately most of our foods like a potato, we've taken from what was a good food and we've changed it over uh, you know, a hundred or hundreds of years to make a food that's rich, richer in sugar and starch rather than the more complex starches, which is what our gut microbiome like. Um, our artichokes, bananas, brilliant. The greener the bananas, the better they are, the worse they taste, the better they are for your microbiome. Uh, green drinks, concentrated green drinks, so chlorella, spirulina, all of those ones, uh, we use a green, one we call green key and it's a combination of them and that is absolutely fantastic for feeding the gut microbiome. So again, a combination, pumpkin, but it comes down to what you should be eating along with the nuts and the seeds and all those other things. And the greater the diversity of foods that you have, the greater the diversity of the fiber, um, the prebiotics, and that means the greater diversity of bacteria. They need to be fed a diverse range to keep that thousand or more there. And that's what happens in the Hansa tribes and, and in the rainforest. It changes from season to season, but as they're picking up the food and they're hunting the food and they're picking it up and having some from up there and they're there, they get a huge variety in their diet. We tend to be grain, meat, dairy, and then a few veggies thrown in there. And that's why our gut microbiome is so small now by comparison. Fibre. Even if the fibre isn't digested, it's great. Now, I'm not giving a plug here to... Uh, to uh, uh, Nudy, they, they're not going to give me a commission, I don't think, but they've got the right idea. You can get the double fibre um, uh, orange juice. Now, you can also get the half fibre orange juice as well. And my message is really simple. Go for the double fibre. Go for the double fibre. Anything. Gut conditions. These are all the conditions linked with it. I've talked about these. I've talked about all of these ones. So your gastrointestinal linked with allergies and so on. Your autoimmune conditions, all of these are linked with it. And all of these studies show that they all benefit from doing a probiotic protocol. Most of them are just done on one probiotic or two probiotic strains. Don't get carried away with that because it's the companies who produce the strains who do the studies. So it's really about just getting that gut microbiome well to fix all of these conditions. Not to reverse them, some of them you probably can't even reverse, but getting it better, improving the conditions. I've, I've known people who can who reverse it. Uh, multiple sclerosis. A um, prominent book called Reversing Multiple Sclerosis by uh, Professor George Jelinek. I won't go into that, ask me about it. Allergies and asthma. 2012, the study showed that a 32% reduction in eczema. Wow! Why isn't everyone doing this? Giving it to infants, particularly if they're caesarean, particularly if there is some dysbiosis. Metabolic illness, all these conditions, which cost, this is 80%. All of these illnesses are the 80% of the costs to do with our medical and our healthcare system, 90% of it. And all of them improved with probiotics and a probiotic protocol, all of them. If you elect me Prime Minister, <laughs> I will make sure everybody going in and coming out of a hospital gets a probiotic protocol. And they have to come to my lectures, because <laughs> we'll make a difference, rather than treating the superficiality that we do at the moment. Infant health, every condition in infants, right through from to colic and you know improves with probiotics you know one of the oh, by the way you know one of the main treatments um for colic what is it um bright water or something you know, you know what that is sodium bicarbonate 
Sodium bicarbonate. It's basically just uh, the same way they treat acid reflux in, in adults using a, a, an alkaline substance. Um, so, and, but we, what we do know, you know, all of these conditions right through from the birthing process being easier on the mother and the baby, the reduction in complications, the re reduction in, in, in um, preterm births, all of those conditions improve with probiotics and a probiotic protocol. This should be. In 10 years, it will be. But can we make it faster? Can you tell this to people? Pregnancy and birth, mental health, food choices, moods, anxiety, depression, stress, Parkinson's and autism spectrum disorder, autoimmune, you know, these, these fit in all types of areas, but at the end of the day, all of these conditions improve. So we've got to, we've got to go back to some really simple basic infections. In a study they did on seniors who took probiotics, they found, and this is what's called a double blind placebo control study. So kind of the, one of the better ways to, to do a study. And they actually found that um, uh, giving seniors a probiotic reduced the risk of getting the flu by 20% and reduced the severity of the flu for those who got it. As distinct from the flu vaccine, which the Cochrane Review says don't work, doesn't work, the scientists said it doesn't work, but probiotics do. Now, while giving it to the kids, to, while giving it to the ad, ad age to improve the flu or reduce the flu, it also does many other benefits. Help makes them feel better, reduce anxiety, reduces diabetes. So it's a win-win situation. It is the poly pill. It is the magic pill. Is a probiotic protocol. That's what it is. If I can sum it up, that's the first time I've called it that, so uh, I, I think it's uh, the best answer towards it. Then we've got healthy ageing. Look at this beautiful skin, 90, look, <laughs> look. Best thing you can do for your skin is feed the gut. And lots of vitamin C and omega-3, but feed the gut. Feed the gut and feed the gut. If you want healthy skin, if you want healthy ageing, if you want the ability to do things as you age, fix the gut. And remember, it's not just probiotics, it's the whole protocol. And here it is. I want to sum it up really simple. It begins at birth, it's a lifetime journey. You've got to get rid of the weeds. So you've got to get rid of the opportunistic species. In our protocol, that's what we tell you, e.g. I've given you hints already, aloe vera and vinegar are great for that. What to eat, you know what to eat, what not to eat. Processed foods, super symbiotics, manage your medication and antibiotics, question the doctors. I don't mind antimicrobial products and toxins. We've got to get rid of these in our society and what we put on our skin and in the air of our homes. They're, they're in shops and stuff, they're injected into the air. Then you've got good water and a healthy lifestyle with managed and lower stress. That's a protocol. And of course you can see what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get our hands dirty. We're supposed to get our hands dirty. So go out there, get some gardening, preferably uncontaminated soil, not near a, high, a highway or anything like that or an industry. So drink more water and liquids. And uh, here, is, uh, here is my, uh, my sales pitch. Will you turn that up for me? Thank you. We'll just